Thank you. I'm Simon Goldschmidt from Etosho. I'm CEO of Etosho. Etosho is, and I can't move, then you can't hear me. Etosho is uh, the first company in the world to launch a platform for distributed e-commerce. I'm going to tell you what distributed e-commerce is. Um, I'm going to tell you how that really empowers the consumer and in effect changing the path where you usually with all other online marketing and sales activities you're trying to move the consumer to where the transaction takes place on the retailer site with distributed e-commerce you reverse that and you actually bring the product to where consumer wants to shop on their premises i'm going to tell you a little bit about how that solves some of the pains for online retailers for some of the publishers some of their shortcomings in the models today and how this is going to solve it and make it easier for them actually to transact online and most importantly how it makes it more convenient for the consumer to to buy your products um, in that space we're going to talk well i'm going to show you the, the the solution and how that is compared to the rest of the online uh, positioning how you see it today with distribution uh, of traffic, of marketplaces and all that, and see how does that actually compare into that. But before I do all that, I want to give you a little bit of background of how that came about. And our eccentric founder um, used to be a partner of a company called Urchant, which became Google Analytics. And they were studying bound rates and figuring out, OK, what happens when you move on from a landing page on Google and what how many actually transact what does it take to transact and when do you drop out and there is actually no pattern which is very surprising there is no direct pattern other than you found out it's a design pattern so basically you say you go in one environment that has a visual um, recognition from the landing page of Google and then if your landing page resembles that a little bit there's a bigger chance that you stay on to finish your transaction that was an interesting finding he also was developing payment gateways in the 90s so in his world it was about how can I connect those two to create a transaction without leaving your the environment that you as a consumer actually start out in and decide to go to instead of being redirected to another environment. So that's a little bit about the background and that ended up in now being what well, we have a, a platform for distributed e-commerce. And basically what we do is we enable people to shop where they get inspired and reversing the flow and say, we bring the whole consumer transaction experience to where they are. And a little bit about how that affects some of the um, mechanisms that you have today across publishers, retailers, and the consumer. And publishers today, in order to monetize their space, either they have to redirect and send the user out of their site and say, okay, to make money, I actually have to, to ask you to leave my store. So today, with this, you can start monetizing your content, and you, the user won't leave, and you'll still make money without cannibalizing on existing uh, uh, advertising model. Other larger publishers do engage in e-commerce, and they start building their own e-commerce systems, their shops, they start investing in inventory, e-commerce, transaction systems and, and payment gateways. This we give them for free and basically just facilitate that environment and we give them full flexibility to en enable that. I'll show you later how that actually plays out. For the retailers, they can definitely create a demand via all the kinds of advertising you have today, but have that to convert is a big task. And, cost of buying traffic is expensive and the cost of recreating demand at when they're going to make the decision is even more costly so with this solution we actually bring the product out to them and they transact at that point of time for the consumer it's basically more convenient 
when you get inspired, you want to shop and then you can challenge that because do you actually shop at the moment when you get inspired and that some of the solutions you will see now, uh, how we have worked uh, to make that more convenient for the user to both get inspired and actually start shopping at the same time for the consumer's convenience. So, so those are some of the dynamics that we're working with um, in e-commerce. The platform itself, on one side you have a large number of retailers that basically feed in their products into our platform, which then redistribute it to any website or any publisher side that you see over here. We have a large number of technologies. In effect, I could actually make a purchase right here and then if I can just recognize, let's say, my jacket, I would scan it with my phone and on my phone I would be able to buy this jacket at that convenience. That's not a market that's mature enough to do that. There's, there's no volume in that, but it gives you that opportunity. What you don't see in the slide is we pick up that order and we feed it back to the retailer as if the order was made on their own website. So the retailer will fulfill uh, the whole system, or, or the whole um, uh, acquisition or, or purchase as if the product was made in their own website. Closing that loop. So I'll give you a few examples of some of the storefronts and engagements in the products as it is today. And clearly there is a large need for what we call, let's say, a sweet spot of the match between content in a media site and the product you actually buy here. So some of the targeting that we work with are predominantly content targeting, content-based, with a mix of behavioral and retargeting and, and, and profiling uh, in how you, you match the orders. But here, this is an AOL site, and you go into the site, it's called Perendish, and I'm sorry the resolution is not perfect, but in this example you can, you can still see that you're out of a, whoa, out of an image. There is a little icon down here, shopping icon. You, you mouse over and you can see the opportunity to actually now expand the shop. And in that article that you're reading and you're getting inspired and my, I'm going to the beach with my kids and all of that, I want to buy these beach shoes. I can go in and I can get a product shot if I want to do that. I can add it to my basket and I can actually close it and I'll stay in the environment that I've always been in. And I don't really have to shop or finish my purchase yet. Now I just want to go back. I want to maybe visit another site. Uh, I still want to get inspired. Now I go to another uh, AOL site called My Daily. It's more about fashion. I go in, I want to get inspired in my fashion thing. I go in and I look at the pants I want to buy. Maybe I want to see something else. I add that one to my basket. I haven't purchased anything yet, but as a consumer, I'm browsing around, I'm getting inspired, I'm actually shopping. I'm shopping around without actually checking out. So that's part of the stickiness and that's part of when I, when I say, how do you actually let people buy when they are inspired? We started out with this where we said, okay, we just wanna go in to a publisher site and just do contextually a match a sweet spot between the right product, the right content. However, what do you do when you go and look at an article? Because there is still some level of decision making uh, of saying, okay, I want to have these pants, maybe I want to talk to my friend or whatever it is before I buy it or whatever you have. So you need to have a little bit of stickiness. And the key thing here is for the retailers, they actually get a new reach into a much earlier stage of decision making and it's cheaper. So a retailer would normally go out, brand themselves, advertise for their products or their offers or whatever they have, try to convert that into their own website um, and then hopefully create the conversion in their own basket and, and all of that. What we do is we deliver the, 
the, the full transaction and the consumer, so it's a consumer acquisition into their system. So the, the retailer can do the cross sales and op sales um, on that order anyways. And we basically um, fulfill the, the needs of a more of an instant shopping, which is much earlier in that stage, in the decision making stage. So those are some of the examples um, that you have. And another, and the last slide I think is, is interesting and I'm not sure how familiar you are with the different kind of uh, online advertising and marketplaces. But what we, um, how we position ourselves and how distributed e-commerce is, you have, I, don't, uh, I didn't put skim links in here, but I'm sure in UK skim links is a big solution where you go in and you uh, can hover over a, a, a text link and you can click to a site where you buy it. They basically monetize contextual inventory still, but they're still redirecting the user away from the site. On the other side, you have all the marketplaces. We just had one example. We had another one with not on the high street. Basically, that's a destination site. The user belongs to that site. You want to go there, so if you as a retailer want to sell your products on that site, you build up the loyalty to the marketplace and not to your own brand, your own site, or whatever have you. We're in the middle of that space where we actually move in and get the same reach based on the publisher's site. We decide that the user, for some reason, at some point, decided to move and, 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 and visit uh, Mail Online, Female Fashion Finder and engage in that, why take them out of that environment? And rather put the product to them and say, okay, I read this, Jodie Foster is wearing this blue dress at the whatever award she's going to, I wanna have the look, or I wanna have the same dress, so I buy it here and then. So what we call ourselves is a distributed marketplace, distributed e-commerce, and solve some of those problems that you have today with redirecting, getting clicks, buying clicks, what are the conversion rates, some of the problems you have with cookie technologies, third part cookies are being restricted, so how can you re-engage with the user? Here it's in the same session and it's based on the, on the consumer's um, demand. So what we're doing is fulfilling the demand created by publishers at the same time as it's, it's created, then we fulfill it. So that's basic, it's very short, it's a little disruptive, uh, but I don't think there's too many misunderstandings in that. I love it. I love it. Right, I've got lots of questions. Who's got questions? Okay, I've got loads of questions here. Cool. Um, you go first. Uh, you talked about uh, having a combined cart. How do you cover delivery for the indiv individual retailers when you put that order through to them? That's a brilliant question. That's a very good question. Right now, we are not engaging in delivery. So that would be a service where we would say, okay, we have one delivery. Today, we're, so you have multiple retailers in one basket, so you'll have to pay multiple delivery services at this stage. But it's a good one, it's on our roadmap. Good, very, very good question. Yeah, hadn't thought of that. Yes, madam. It's fascinating that the order would come from two different places. So would they then need to enter their delivery information and payment information twice or all just once? Right. We have uh, the, another very good question. Uh, we actually have, one of the reasons we can do this is we have the permission as the only company in the world to receive a transaction on a website we don't have ownership of. You get that with Visa, MasterCard, all the payment providers, or via the payment service providers. And to do that, you can store cart data. You can store the, the, the user data. So you do that once, and you, you basically, in that example I showed, uh, let's say in here, you go in and you have a profile. And we can store that, that profile, so we have your card data, we have your billing address, your delivery address, and all of those uh, profiles you have, so it's, it's very simple. We haven't launched the one-click shopping experience. It's there, you just need a password. It's a matter of, it's, it's both technical and commercially 
a timing issue of when we uh, uh, deliver or launch that. But when you go into, let's say, the Daily Mail, they have a loyalty club. So you have a loyalty program with a female fashion finder. How are we going to merge those two profiles? So you, with a Daily Mail profile, can start shopping on some of Bauer Media's uh, uh, publisher sites with the same profile. So there's a few of the, uh, technically it's not a problem. Some of the media that we're working with are not happy about the solution, so it's about data sharing. But technically, and in most cases, it's, it's, it's not something you have to re-enter. So it's kind of like a shopping agent for us as... Yes. So presumably, you're, are you paid by the publisher to put the software on their site? No. Who's paying you? Yeah. Are you getting a cut of the, of the transaction from we the retailer? Get, we, we get a cut. We get a commission of the transaction from the retailer. So the retailer gets a, a new sales channel. There is no fixed fees in that channel. We need, we need to believe in the conversion rates that we can create. We believe that we are shortening the path to conversion and offering a better uh, conversion rate than they can get when buying traffic based on, on the whole hypothesis and analysis of saying, okay, bounce rates. We don't want to have the bounce rates, and we're experiencing large conversion rates. What we are working with right now is to not be between 3 and 5% of, of, of the page views on a website. Because when you come as a consumer to a website and you only sometimes see that you can buy out of this article, you won't buy it. But if you can see that you constantly can buy out of this media and then browse around, there is a bigger tendency to buy. So the media where we have much more relevance with the products, a, a bigger catalog to cover the contextual space, we see much bigger conversion rates. We pick up the, the commission and we share the commission 50-50 with the, with the publisher. And the publisher uh, experiences incremental revenue. We are not cannibalizing on any other banner revenue or the click, click away revenue they might have on their website. And at the same time, we deliver a full e-commerce solution to them for free, which they don't, today they invest a lot of resource and cash uh, in managing their, their, um, their e-commerce solution. And then based, today we have a little less than 200 retailers with their full catalog. On, on our feed, and they have full access as a, as a publisher, you have full access to 180 retailers uh, catalog. Does the publisher have to do anything on their site to get the intelligence into the lookup words? We put in a single script in the, in the header or footer of the content management system, and then... But do they have to give you access to do that? Yes. So they sign a T, they click off a TNC, and then uh, place the script. And what I can't show on this computer, but if I would be an administrator, we would share the administration. Either we have, so there's different technologies of how to create the shop. We could automize it. So we would just make a shop out of the most relevant word or image that makes a match to the matching product. But that's not how we can do it yet, because there's a lot of editors in a publisher who says, OK, but I like Hugo Boss better than I like Tiger of Sweden two different <laughs> brands might be in the same. So our technology might choose Tiger of Sweden, where the editor would like Hugo Boss. So basically, we have um, what we call a um, product integration tool. And it's, a, it's an integration to, it's a Chrome extension, where you basically can search in our whole catalog. You mark a little place on the, on the website. You right click on it, you say add product, you make a search in, the, in, in our catalog across all the retailers, you click it, and there is the shop that I showed you before, which could be maybe better shown in the, in the Huffington. So you add it to your browser through, through a Chrome extension? Yes. And, and then it's, you train it, it. And there you go. And then you, you create a shop out of that in less than a minute. I like that. Yes, I like that a lot. You need a lot of scale to get people using this. That's true. Massive scale. That's true. That's you can't a different... stay in Copenhagen much longer. 
Uh -uh. But a lot of good businesses came out of Copenhagen. <laughs> Did, do the customers need to be signed up for a tow show? Not necessarily. It's, it's one of our services, like the one-click shopping. In order to do a one-click shopping, you need to have a password. You need to sign up. So, so we can store it, and you need to give us the permission to say, OK, now you have a password. You don't have to bring out the plastic every time you want to buy. So now you just type in your password. So yes, when you get to that point, yes. Otherwise, you can just go one by one. But you don't see, if I saw this article and I clicked on it, then I could buy it, but I would enter my details. On le first time. For the first time. Yes, yeah. the first time. And then later, if I wanted my details saved, I would have to. That would just be pre-filled. Okay. So I go in, and I should have done one with my own profile, of course. But then you just add it to basket, and then you have delivery, and then you would have your, it would be filled in already on your profile. OK, interesting. So when you go to the payment, Simon, where are you going to at that point? Because um, I like to put everything through Amazon. That's our gateway. So the thing is, we receive the money from the consumer, and we sit on that with, and again, that's more of a security. We don't really need it, need it, because some of the retailers would be out of that cash for up to 14 days, because there is a return right uh, for the consumer to have that. So we sit on the cash, and then after 14 days, we give minus the commission, we pay the money out to, or we deliver the money to the retailer. But it's one of those security things that we need to have in there in order to be able to receive a payment on a website that's not our own. So it's kind of like a mobile one-click, isn't it? It is. It is. And it, it's, it's, we can't call it one-click shopping. We're going to call it something different. <laughs> right, I love it. Any more questions? Yeah, Zoe, I would have thought you'd have a hundred questions. Okay, so from a merchant's point of view, um, let's say I was running, or well, I'm running my e-commerce business, um, it seems at the minute that I wouldn't have the opportunity to up or cross sell at the minute. So the opportunity is just that one item they might want to buy on that page that they found. Is that correct? Uh, in a standard setup, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was fine. Um, but, but we deliver the full order to you, so you can upsell and cross-sell. We don't deliver a full permission, but we, we deliver the fact that we buy from you. We buy from the merchant, so the merchant has to confirm the order, and they can then say, OK, we recognize that you bought this, blah, blah, blah. Will you uh, uh, receive uh, offers from us on that was kind of my related next question. offers? Do we, related do, offers, yeah. Do we get... Um, Apps one to one contact with a person who's bought? Yes, we did, yes. So from there on, they're just like a normal customer. There's just a limited in a yes. way. It's yes. not on the high street where earlier, and there's a slightly different, you don't, you're not allowed to have that one to one afterwards. No, we, you can do cross sale and off sales, but not for the reason we don't offer that in this, we want people to convert. Oh, well, yeah, of course, it's about the impulse and doing things yeah. straight away. Yeah. And um, what about the data? Do we get, would we get the data of where they found The retailer this? gets, uh, no, they don't get the data where they transact. Right, okay. Because we don't, it's not like affiliate where you would go out and say, okay, this affiliate partner transacts so much for me. Mm -hmm. We're following the content. So one article sells one day a book, and the next same media has written an article about running, and then they might sell running shoes. And um, we are optimizing on the content and less of, uh, of what media or what publisher you're working with. Okay, so. Um as, as a merch, so it's, so it's fairly different from the Google Shopping. We wouldn't get any information about how many impressions, that kind of technology. You get, yeah, you get all the KPI. You get all the, the, the anonymous uh, uh, aggregated data of say, okay, how many, how many times have this product not the been, been viewed? How many times has it been clicked, sold, and all the order values and all of that? We just don't connect it to a specific website because there's no agreement between the website and the merchant. And so right, you, okay. So, it won't so, so in the minute you're looking, you're trying to grow the business, obviously, and get a lot more people signing up, uh, which means those people, early, early adopters, are going to get the benefits of um, every time there's a, a word that matches their product, 
they're going to get the benefits of that, and then it will become more competition for those particular words and phrases. I'm not sure I understood that. Well, where, where you've got something that you can click on it, it becomes a product. So there's, the, someone's published some content, yeah. and that clicks. And you said you talked about it linking to um, a certain brand, and you've got some kind of algorithm behind that matches the actual product to so, that thing. So right now we have internally a suggestive. That's the that's storefront. What, yeah. Yes. It, before we actually release it and say this is this is the best algorithm, so we go in and say, okay, we scrape the site and we say, is it a brand? Is it a product? What is it that actually makes this? We would also like to connect it to the profile of the user on retargeting technologies and say, okay, this is the product we want to show. However, in order for us to roll out with the larger media that are not used to this, their editors are very concerned about what kind of, so let's say it's, a, it's, let's say it's an article about Hugo Boss, but they mention uh, Tiger of Sweden. How are we gonna suggest Tiger, to buy Tiger of Sweden out of a Hugo Boss article? So th there is some contradiction to editors' interests sometimes, and that's why we keep it manual still. Right, okay, thank you. Does that, does that answer the yeah, question? Yeah, that does, okay. that does. I, I suspect that um, as you get more and more people signed up, the algorithm will change on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah, of course, so. of course, and, and it, it's a data game. Yeah, uh, you've got more data. Definitely, and yeah. we don't want to keep it manual, but we have to, and there's a big learning in that, and, and there's also when you say rolling this out to larger publishers, they need to learn it as well. So it is, it would be very intrusive if we just come out and say, okay, we, we take over your inventory. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, Simon, um, big bloggers, have you got a business model to compensate the big bloggers so they can get a cut of the articles they post that drive yeah. the content into the publishing stream that then benefits the retailer that then benefits you? Yeah. We start, actually, the first partners we had in Denmark was Bloggers Delight, and that's about 140 fashion bloggers. They are... Uh, just happy and crazy about blogging about fashion uh, and we integrate it with them so they can go in on their blog and do one-to-one -one matches which was the best thing for us because then we could go to the retailers and say we have a, <laughs> a bunch of bloggers that want to talk about your products they also want to sell them when they talk about it do you can we sell your products on this platform so yeah it's it's not it's 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 neutral and so, can a blogger make money through it? Uh, sometimes. So it's a matter. So that's the right question. How much traffic do you have on your website? How much can you convert? And how good a recommendation do you give your users? Do you give them so they can browse around, or do you give them enough uh, recommendations so they will actually buy the product? Some of the good examples we had is not only when a blogger says, "Okay." I think you should try this red dress. It's when they can connect it to a profile that went to an event wearing a certain piece of clothes that people start buying. That's one of the learnings we have. There's a few other learnings where, which is really powerful where in the same media group, which is, uh, it's called Egmund, which is a Nordic version of Bauer Media where they have a lot of female fashion uh, uh, brands. One is for 40 plus, and the other one is, is a young, uh, young segment. And we can actually see that in, it's called uh, In Shape, one of them, they buy the, the, the fitness gear. In the other site, they buy the books and all that behind it, and I wanna, lose weight and, and all that. And it's really, really powerful information to see, okay, what do people buy in these different uh, um, media? And we're not gonna do any branding, that's not our business, but for branding, it's also interesting to see, okay, what kind of shopping behavior does my, peop my, my consumers have, or what kind of shopping behavior fits into the different brands of, of the media that you're working with, and that's gonna help you market yourself also when you do broader branding activities. Uh, and do you, do you let the retailers know my profile and where else I shop when I've shopped with them? 
No, only with them. We only share. So, so you if we sell resell. your product, we give you the detail of what happens on your on the sales of, of the of your product, but not across. Why not? That's our data. We're not sure how to use it yet. But they'll pay for it. Maybe we don't have a model where where we pay for it right yet. It's 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 clearly one of those things where we want to monetize the data eventually and figure out, you know, what's the value of it. But if you, as one retailer, understands the, what the same consumer bought at one of your competitors, it's not something we can just share. It's it's going to be a barrier for people to say, okay, I want to sell my stuff here because then all my competitors know about my users as well and all that. It's it's a little premature for us to have a model to share that kind of data. Brilliant. Brilliant. Anybody else? I thought that was a really good presentation. There's a lot of insight in there. We're done. So that's... Yes. Yeah. Whose uh, responsibility is it to connect um, the, the product to, say, the article? Is it the publisher's responsibility or is it the retailer's? Retailer. The retailer. So it's still the retailer's. That's why we share all the data, the consumer data, with the retailer. The, the, the publisher is just a nest. They do what they do best, create content. And we piggyback on that and say, okay, this is where people get inspired. We want to sell here. Can we borrow your, in your editorial inventory with all of this? We are facilitating a transaction. That's all it is. And then uh, we feed that order back to the retailer who does what they do best, fulfill an order. Are you kind of like a mobile bank? You can say that. You're, you, but right now, we don't use the money that is in our, is it, we, we, the banks sit on that for security reasons. So we can't reinvest if, with, the, with that. But yes. That's a really good presentation. Thank you. It's time for lunch. Give Simon a round of applause. Thank you.